So welcome back to this um, um, advanced seminar. So um, I will today briefly talk about the, the topic that you watched uh, the last time. So regarding the Mark of J Monte Carlo, I think this might be a new topic to many of you. So I guess it is worth uh, repeating that a little bit. So the idea is that um, we want to get the posterior and uh, when the model is simple and we could use approaches like the grid approximation to find um, the posterior. And there is no way that, well, there's no need in this way that we want to go to too complex. So to use MCMC, but when the model is getting too complicated, um, when there are multiple parameters, as we could imagine, and it's quite time consuming to have a proper uh, grid approximation. So if, for example, we have five parameters and all of the five parameters, they are between zero and one. And then let's say we want to have a grid approximation with tiny steps. So with a tiny step with a 0.01, for example. So all of the five, we will have 0.01 as a small step. So in total, we will have 101 to the power of five, that many of combinations to do this great approximation, right? So this is a large number, um, but if you think, well, I don't care about running so long, I can just let it run and then it will give me the result. This is fine. But um, the practical consideration here is that if we have a that large number of matrix or array, for example, in this huge dimension, the modern, the modern computer, they usually wouldn't handle it. So it doesn't have that much memory to handle this um, grid approximation. So it's not possible to even do it. So this is the practical reason. And uh, it also that um, it's getting really, really complicated. And some of them, they don't even have, a, they don't even have an analytical solution. So we just can't solve it. So if this is possible, what we do, then we will use Markov chain Monte Carlo MCMC to approximate the shape of the post area. So then uh, you watch the video and then there were some considerations of Markov chain Monte Carlo. And in essence, there is an analogy of using a MCMC robot of approximating the posterior. So imagine this is like the mountain or kind of example where somewhere is high, somewhere is low. So the, this, with some decision rules. So this is the robot decision rule is like, if the place is, new place is high, then I go there. If the new place, is low, then I, I go there with a probability proportional to the ratio between the new location and the old location. So if in this case, uh, the ratio is pretty high still, and I still go there. And if in another scenario, the ratio is pretty low, then I don't really go there very often. So what is the result? What is the consequence of MCMC robot, right? So the consequence of MCMC robot is that, um, <clears throat> that the place so the mountain where, where the place it is high, the MCMC robot will visit there more often. And when the place is uh, low here and here, then the MCMC robot will not visit there as often as the, the high places. So in total, if we uh, summarize the locations and the frequency, the, if we summarize the frequencies of the visits per place, and we take the histogram of the, of the visits, and then we will see that the histogram is a good approximation to the original um, posterior. So here's another example of 2D and you saw that. And then this one is the, the, the idea I said, there is the true um, posterior and then we visit using the rule of MCMC approach. And then here above is the histogram of summarizing the visits per location and we see here this one from above and then here this one below. This is a good approximation, right? And this is discrete um, um, variable. And when we have continuous variable, we have something like a curve and we want to approximate the shape of the curve. So there's MCMC robots again, moving from somewhere with a random location, random starting point and goes uh, into the middle because the middle part 
the location is high, I supposedly the MCMC robot will visit those places more often. And uh, with, uh, as time goes by, so here they visit those places even more often. And then uh, eventually uh, the shape will be pretty much only look at the shape, not the exact magnitudes. It's only the shape here and here. They, they match pretty much um, very well. <clears throat> Good. And uh, so we imagine that if there is only one MCMC robot, maybe the result is reliable, maybe not. So maybe if the mountain is there's only one peak, is a this is an easy shape to approximate. But if the mountain is like somehow quite complicated with a complicated shape, then we might want to send out uh, multiple MCMC robots to visit with the hope that if they come back, they will give us similar results. And this means our results are reliable and we could trust our results. And what does this mean uh, for MCMC? This means we have multiple chains. So in this case, one, two, three, yellow, uh, green, and uh, blue. Uh, they start, there are multiple chains for one and for two, they even start from different uh, starting points. So again, as I said, the hope is that if they are independent chains, they randomly start from some location. And if, if, if eventually they reach somehow the simple, the same um, conclusion that is great, right? And this is another example uh, showing the, the, the chain starts from here, the MCMC starts from here and then moves uh, along the places where the density is high, and then to give us the, the results. <clears throat> and so, so here that there, there, uh, we have three properties actually. So one property is the number of chains, number of MCMC robots. We have yellow, green, and blue, there are three. And then the second one is the starting point. We have here, here and here as the starting location. And we actually have a, a last property. So the last property is how many steps they are visiting, right? So maybe like, let's say 2000. So here I go from starting point and go to somewhere here, here, like 2000. So this is the length of the chain. So uh, for simple shapes, if it is uh, easy to sample from, then maybe we don't need, we don't even need that many steps. But if the shape is complicated, maybe we need more uh, steps. So here in this case, if I say, well, in a like extreme scenario, if I only give the MCMC chains three steps, right? So here, start on location, one, two, three, here starting location, one, two, three. Here starting location, one, two, three. It, it doesn't give us so much information, right? So only when the chain moves for a, a decent amount of time and decent amount of steps, we are able to get um, the, the posterior. So now the practical question is, we could set up multiple chains, maybe three, maybe four, maybe even more. We could say, well, computer, hey, just give me some random locations, random starting points, do it. Yeah, good. But how many chains, uh, how many samples are we, do we have? How, many, how long, how long the, the chain should, have, should be? This is the decision that we have to make as, uh, as researchers. So we will see more examples here. Now what I'm saying is quite abstract. Just try to follow, follow me, but if, if not, doesn't matter. So there are default choices from computer software. So let's say like uh, 2000 samples, and then the chain is moving, um, the MCMC ro robot is moving 2000 steps. And then we could evaluate the results. So if the result says that the, the model estimation is great, is reliable, then we can say, well, 2000 is enough. But maybe in other scenarios, using 2000 and then evaluating the results. And then the result says, no, the, the chain, they don't really give a good mix up. Some chain go here, some chain go there. You have to do uh, longer. There are, there are warning messages to suggest you that maybe try increase the length will help. Then you just follow the rule, right? So there are some criteria, evaluation criteria for you to look at and then use this uh, output 
for you to make some newer uh, adjustments to your model. Okay, good. So I guess the watch the video more or less. And then there are multiple, so MCMC is an entire family of algorithms. So the MCMC robots example that I showed you either in person or maybe in video, um, that is one specific, I, I think it is one of the, the simplest um, MCMC method. So there are more MCMC methods. So like all of this rejection sampling, important sampling, metropolitan sampling, and GIPS, uh, GIPS sampling. But there is an earlier version that does MCMC, which is which was, I think, pretty popular in psychology and cognitive neuroscience in JAX. I also started with JAX when I started learning this. And then we've, I realized, we realized that there are some drawbacks. One of them is it takes just too long and then the algorithm is not so efficient. And then we realized that um, there is something even newer at the time, 2015, it was pretty new, the standard language. So it's called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. The MCMC robots, the decision rule is actually quite different than the one I described, but more or less follows the idea. So here, uh, because MC, uh, HMC, the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo HMC is the most state of the art, I would say, until now. So we will be focusing on that um, for the seminar. So um, there are actually multiple languages um, that are implementing HMC. So HMC is not specific to STEM. There are multiple. So for example, there's a Python language only specific to Python, it's PyMC3 uh, that does HMC. And I believe uh, maybe. So uh, there is now a, a PyMC4 already available that is not so well tested, I think. It is developed, but it's not so well tested and it's not yet popular. But anyway, uh, we will be focusing on uh, STEM. <clears throat> Just that if you want to mm, look at this in the future, you know that this is available and you know the keyword to, uh, to look for. Yeah, okay, I stop a little bit. So any questions? Everything's good. Okay. There's a comment or questions when are there too many parameters for MCMC to be still efficient. Now, ah, this is a really good point. Um, <laughs> I, I give you a few numbers. So for this globe tossing example, like the nine times of experiment that we've been seeing for multiple times already, nine times of experiment and six times of water uh, observation, simple model when using default four MCMC chains and each of them start randomly from a random location and the chain length is 2000, the default, as I mentioned. It's a few, a few seconds, I think, less than a minute, maybe one, maybe more than one minute. It depends on your computer, but definitely five, less than five minutes. And uh, uh, if there are two parameters or three, I think this is still uh, uh, pretty fast. So number of parameters is one consideration. The other one is also your sample size. So if there are nodes uh, nine and six, there are 900,000 and 600,000. It might take longer. I say might, it is because in this simple model, it won't make too much difference because we can utilize the advantage of using vectorization, we will see later. So Stan is pretty efficient that if this is a like vectorized model, it can run regardless of the dimension. Nine or six, 900,000 or 600,000, it won't make so much difference. But for example, if we have more complicated uh, scenarios, when we have cognitive models, like in the second half of the seminar, we will need to loop from the first participants to the last participants. And within each person, 
we will also have a loop from the first trial. Imagine that this is a nested loop, like subject, subject loop in the outer and the trial loop in the inner. So if, if we have 100 person, and if we have 100 trials per person, this is a like, you know, 10,000 combinations. And this might run a little bit longer. And let's say if we have a 10, 10 parameters per person, and if we have, have 100 person, as I said, so how many parameters we have? We have 1,000 parameters, right? And if we also run like in a hierarchical fashion that we will cover in the future, in a few weeks, there will be a few more that captures the, the upper level, population level parameters that governs indiv the individual differences. Doesn't matter if you don't understand what, what I'm saying. I, I just say that there are like more than 1,000 parameters. In this case, uh, it might run a little bit slower. <laughs> so maybe a few hours, one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, can be eight hours, 10 hours can be a few days. So if you, if you have a large data set, if you work on a data set from a consortia, like multiple centers in Europe, for example, if you have data from 5,000 participants, some, then maybe a few, few more days. But now the question is a little bit tricky. So the time that it will take to run the model is not really equivalent to the, eff the sampling efficiency it might still be efficient. So in a, if we have one parameter, we have one D, right, one dimension. If we have two parameters, imagine this is a table, one dimension on the X axis, the other dimension on the Y axis, two dimensions. If we have 3D, you can imagine that as a, as a, as a cube, four dimensional, I don't know how to visualize, but four. If we have 1,000 dimensions, 1,000 parameters, we just have a 1,000 dimensional parameter space. The sampling algorithm per se, it is still efficient, but it just takes longer to sample it. You see what I mean? So it's not that if that takes long, that doesn't mean it's, it doesn't mean it's not uh, efficient. It can be still efficient, efficient, but it depends on the size itself, the parameter space, and also the, the sample size. If you have 10 people versus if you have uh, 100, 1000 participants. So everything has to be considered in this case. <clears throat> and comparably, if uh, you use JAX, for example, in the, in, the, in the hypothetical example that I gave you, the 100 person and 100 trials, a hierarchical fitting and all of everything is complicated. If you use JAX, it, it will definitely be slower than STEM. This is, this is for sure that I can tell you. So because the sampling algorithm is less efficient relative to HMC. Make sense? <clears throat> Good. All right. If no other burning questions at the moment, let's just continue. So, and now we now know how MCMC works conceptually and how, that, how can that be re relevant uh, to our practical example. So now we have to do this a little bit <clears throat> more practically. Um, from a broader perspective, we, we are now dealing with two languages. So one is R, R Studio, the other one is STEM. So STEM itself, it is a language. And uh, we are now calling STEM from R. So the idea is now we are preparing our data. So when we collect the data from experiment or anything anywhere online or in person, <clears throat> we remove some missing trials, for example, and we do some like simple analysis, and then we want to fit some model, right? So what we do is we will prepare our data that is um, readable, that is STEM friendly, and we send the STEM, we send the data from R to STEM, 
understand itself itself is a language and it does the motor feeding and using like the MCMC algorithm and trying to find the posterior space where it's high, where it's low and using the algorithm that we discussed like HMC in this particular case. And when everything is finished, a few seconds, a few minutes, a few hours, a few days. So these results will be returned back to R and we will work on those results. And the results, what are the results? Those are samples, like the, the visits per location from the MCMC robots. And then we draw inferences from the samples returned from Stan to R. So if some people, they don't like R, but they still want to use Stan, can it be possible? Yes, definitely. So here, the left-hand side, this one, this can be Python, can be MATLAB, can be anything, can be whatever. So you prepare the data from whichever software you are using, give it to Stan, Stan does the work and give it back to you. So this is the idea. There is a, also one uh, possibility, which is called CMD Stan for command Stan. That means I can simply open the command window and then I work on, uh, I work with stand from, from my terminal, from my command window without even using a software. This is also possible. <clears throat> and maybe you heard about something called Stata. If you are, if you studied, if you, if, if you have friends studying economics, for example, they use Stata a lot. SPSS, then maybe it's not there. I, I'm not sure. And then there's a newer language called Julia, and Julia can also do like crazy stuff. And you can also call stand from, from um, Julia and then return back to it. But anyway, it is pretty flexible and versatile. And now we are here uh, dealing with R and uh, the associated package, R stand. And if we are calling stand from Python, there's a package called Pi stand. And if it is MATLAB, MATLAB stand. If it's Starta, Starta stand. <laughs> if it's Julia, Julia stand. So you, you see this multiple options. All right, so we have stand, we have R stand, and what does it mean for us in this particular case? So we have covered, we have introduced uh, the steps of doing modeling. So the first one, come up with the data stories, where, the, how, how the heck the data are generated, right? Those is the question, where, why those data are generated? What is the process? What can be the reason? for the data to be observed or observed. And then we have it, and then we do uh, the updating by incorporating the real data, and then we do the evaluation. And if this works, great, we go uh, write a paper. If this is not, we come up with, come up with another data story, and then we do uh, the following step one more time. So all of the data stories is recorded that what is modeling. So modeling is defined like appropriate, linking function slash likelihood function, linking the known to the unknown. What is known, the data, what is the unknown parameters? And those are the, 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 the data stories. And so in this particular case, what does that mean in terms of STAN? That means we will write a STAN model. So the STAN model is our data story. Our data story is a STAN story written in the STAN language where we can read, STAN can read, computer can read, everyone's happy. Okay, <laughs> STAN data story. So the update part is running model estimation in the interface, within the interface of R stand. So actually between R and R stand, so send data and then send samples back. So do the evaluation. And uh, then how we can evaluate the data, we just evaluate the samples in R using the samples that are generated and then returned from R stand. And then if you know uh, shiny, shiny apps, so there are possibilities to call an interactive web browser-based apps at, uh, created from R uh, to operate stand samples. This is also possible. So this is called shiny stand. We don't cover that in the, in the seminar, but uh, this is possible and you could, you're welcome to try it out <clears throat> uh, by yourself. All right, just quickly, 10 second summary. What is the data story here? Data story means we write a data model, a likelihood model in the STAN language. Update here means we estimate our the model using the STAN language. And the evaluation means we will operate um, the sample from STAN, draw inference, draw conclusion, and write a paper. 
And uh, so this slide is only for information. You don't need to know, but maybe good to know. And uh, so the steps of using STAN, we are not using STAN. The computers are like running STAN, right? So how to run it. So the first step is that if you run, write a stand data story, this is like writing a paper, right? Writing a book, that the book is written in the stand language is about how the data is generated. Uh, and this, this, this model is, re is read by audience. In this case, the audience is the computers. The computer will read the data story and the stand computer program will be read into uh, the memory of the computer. <clears throat> Like for example, this is how a stand data story would look like. Um, the, and then, then the computer will uh, uh, compile, this step is called compile, to compile the stand data story to a C++ story. So because for computers, stand story is nicely written, but the computer, they prefer another language, which is called C++, which is more efficient. And in fact, the compilation, compiling from Stan language to C++ language is one of the reasons that why Stan is efficient because usually for modern computers, C++ is really fast and efficient. JAX doesn't do this, so it's slow. And then the C++ uh, is then uh, connected with the data and then do the feeding. Okay, this is a little bit technical, just good to know, but you don't need to so here, this is another screenshot, and this is a little bit more compli complex model. This one maybe runs a few seconds, and then this one maybe, I don't know, runs a few hours. It can be easy, it can be complex. So it depends on how you will write your story, right? Imagine, so if you are an author, you write novels, you write like children novels, your audience is like uh, um, kids, three to five, eight years old. Versus if you are writing Harry Potter, and then this language is complicated, right? So it depends on the audience. It can be simple and easy and easy to understand, straightforward to understand, it can be complex because you convey different stories. And then you run the STEM program, you get the results, and then you do the analysis. Okay, good. <clears throat> Let's dive into the language a little bit. So suppose if you are an author, you want to write uh, the stand model, the stand data story. There are some structures you can follow. So we know well that if you write a book, this in the, fir the first chapter, the first chapter is usually the background, right? So if you read Harry Potter and then there's the, the boy and then the, the parents dead killed by some person and then it's sent to the, the family of the uncle, something like that. So this, this is the background. The first uh, paragraph, uh, uh, chapter is about that. And then the story develops and then the pieces are connected. And then there's the conclusion, the same thing here. So we have a structure of doing uh, STEM modeling. They are divided into STEM language blocks, like the book chapters. So we have multiple here. We have six, at least six, and there are more. So what are relevant for us, that they are six. The first one in this particular case, we will use a block called data, which is unsurprisingly to define what data do we have, which is the known part. So I repeat again, doing modeling is to find appropriate linking function, likelihood function, connecting the known to the unknown, right? So the data part is the known part, what we know already, write it down there, what we have, data ABC, and then we have it. Transform the data is to just reshape pre-processing your data. So if your data is a little bit in shape one, you want to shape it in shape one and you want to change it to shape two, you can do it here and transform the data just to transform your data, literally. Parameters, this is the unknown part. So we, we, we use our linking function to connect, to connect known together with unknown. The known part is in the data. So where's the unknown? The unknown is in the parameters block. Similarly, transform the parameters is to like transform or change some format of your data and uh, force them to process in an easier fashion. And so then the next one is the most important one in the STAN language, which is, which is called the model block. This is the place to define your linking function, your likelihood function, your core story of your novel. 
the core chapters of your novel. Here, everything happens here. So you define some interesting priors and you define how your data is connected with the likelihood function associated with the parameters using the specific statistical distribution. We've seen binomial, we've seen a uniform distribution, we've seen uh, the, the, the Bernoulli and normal distribution and everything. So here is also the place where we need to specify the statistical distribution. Okay. And then lastly, because this is like a chapter or book chapter, and then at the very last, you maybe want to convey some ideas to the to the readers, to the audience. And here the generated quantity is to like summarize some of the results that you have. And then you read, write it down here in the final um, block, which is called generated quantity. <clears throat> Yeah, good. This is just conceptual uh, structure. Any questions here? Hi. Hi. Yeah, I would have a question. Um, yeah. What is it meant with um, pre-processing of the parameters? Like, can, can you give me an example or? Yeah, yes, 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 yeah. So uh, maybe pre-processing is not the correct word. Um, let me see. How should I give you an example? <clears throat> well, maybe I can give you a stu stupid example. So uh, maybe I can use actually use the structure. Okay, then use this color, okay, good. So let's say here I have a parameter theta, where theta is between zero and one. And for some reason, I want to have a parameter in between zero and two. So I have a theta one equals theta plus one. This is semicolon. So yeah, really stupid example, but this is uh, how you can do it in these two blocks, parameters and transform the parameters. So usually what you do is in, in this block, you could already define a parameter in between zero and one, one and two, but uh, for some reason you can also do this way. First declare define parameter between zero and one and add one to it, so it becomes between zero and uh, between one and two, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There's another question: Why am I allowed to transform parameters when I don't know them yet, or able rather than I don't know your question? Can you explain, elaborate a little bit? Um, yeah, because you said um, we're doing all of this to figure out the parameters. And um, why do we define them if we want to figure them out? Ah, so yeah, already... the range. Yes, the range. We define the range and then I... we know the posterior. Ah, yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, in our case, um, the original case, we have like the theta, which is water covering the entire um, earth. So our prior is like, 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 like this, right? Zero and one, and it is uniform. And uh, afterwards, it becomes this, more, more or less. So the zero one here is the range that we have to define in this block. And then this is the prior, we give it here. And then this is the posterior. We get it after the model fitting. Is this where, where the theory comes in? So um, um, I'm taking height as an example. It wouldn't make sense to make the range go, you know, lower than zero, definitely not, but also not higher than four meters. Yeah, yes, yes. 
yeah something like that okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. this is called um, domain knowledge right you know <laughs> you have some general ideas about some possible values of something that you're interested in weight or height nobody has negative weight negative height so this is like make, making better sense to give uh, the reasonable range okay thanks thank you <clears throat> Any other questions? Good. So if not, then let's just actually do it uh, using stand the language to analyze our already quite familiar um, globe tossing example. Let's look at it, look at it again to so have a revisit. So we have the sequence water land water land uh, nine times in total, and six of them they are the water observations, and the entire process follows the binomial. So if there is a success rate, it can also be uh, zero or one. It can be either zero or one. Water water or land and tail or head. In the coin example, they are all the same. So binomial model or binomial process. And then we can like write it in a more generic way. So if you write a paper regarding how much uh, of the earth is covered by water, this is your research paper. And you have an introduction, you'll say, well, this is earth and it's composed of two parts. One is water, the other is land. And we don't know which is which, <laughs> we don't know the proportion. And we want to find out, okay, this is the introduction part. And uh, the methods section, you'll say, well, we cannot operate, we cannot really handle the, the earth, but we can handle instead the small world, the globe. I go to a store, I buy a globe and toss a catch, I toss a catch. And so the results, uh, we had nine times of experiments and six of them are water. Those are the results part, behavioral analysis. And then what we do, we do computational modeling. So uh, in the modeling session, we will write down, this is our model that we are interested in. In one line, you will describe, describe your process as follows. So binomial is the name of the process. Capital N is the total number of experiments or trials. And the W is the number of water observation and theta is the unknown parameter. And how, how, how to read this? This reads like, I think I have this, yeah. So it reads like W here is distributed as a binomial distribution with number of trials capital N and success rate of theta. And this one can be generalized. So how to generalize that? We say, well, we have a parameter mu and it follows a normal distribution. And maybe this is not mu theta, mu sigma, okay. So how to read it is same thing. So theta is distributed as a normal distribution with the location parameter mu and a scale parameter sigma or standard deviation uh, parameter sigma, same thing. So uh, if this is another distribution, we didn't mention too much, let's say, well, uniform, uniform, and um, zero and uh, one another theta, how to read this, it reads like theta is distributed as a uniform distribution in between the range zero and one. Well, you can also be a little bit more specific. You say distributed as a uniform distribution with the lower end zero and upper end of one. And everything is like this. <clears throat> okay. And then, uh, so before we move on, we have to introduce a little bit more terminology um, to graphically represent our models. So this is graphical illustration of types of variables. And there are, there are two dimensions or two categories. And each of the categories, for each of the category, there are two levels. So let's look at here. So it's for, for the type of the data or the variables, they are either known or unknown, right? The parameters are unknown, but uh, the data, they are known. So here we say this is 
unobserved, this is observed. So if anything, it is observed. So with a color, so we use like a shaded area to represent it. So this is the observed data. And if it is unknown, it, if it is unobserved, we just don't use any color. So the background is white or transparent. <clears throat> and then the second category or the second dimension is uh, whether the data or the type of the variable is discrete or continuous. We talked about this a lot, right? When, beginning from when we were talking about uh, probability mass function was a probability density function. We make the distinction between discrete variables versus continuous variables. So here we have to do the same thing. So for the continuous variables, we use the shape of a circle. And then for the discrete variables, we use the shape of a square. <clears throat> and then this is a two, this is two. We have two by two in total. We have four combinations. So here we have unknown continuous, a known continuous. This is unknown discrete, and this is known uh, discrete, okay? And now with this terminology, the four like, shapes with the colors, and we could like graphically describe our model. So uh, in this way, so we have the, we have just only three variables, not so many. We have only three. We have capital N, we have small w, we have the theta, okay? So imagine, so if in most of the cases, if we know this formula and we know that uh, this one, they are predicted or determined by both the n and the theta. So to write it, we could write uh, the w in the middle. It is determined by both the capital N and by the theta or the p, this can be theta. So the arrow, the arrow here is pointing here. So here that means W is determined by both of these two. And using the, uh, this table as a reference, we know that capital N discrete number of experiments it can only be integers, right? Discrete variables, it's, it's known so that there is a shaded color. W, same idea as shaded, uh, discrete. And theta is continuous it is unknown so it is this color circle without background <clears throat> so we know this graphical representation we also know this from the last slides already and there is actually a little bit missing so the missing part is here we because we are doing bayesian uh, data analysis we will have to specify the prior distribution so the prior distribution theta or p is a uniform so just as i draw uh, it is with equal probability between zero and one, okay? Then this is everything that we need for now. <clears throat> Does that make sense? So now we have everything already. We know the data, we know the likelihood function. We also have unknown parameter theta. And we have the pieces, we have the ingredients of cooking. And what we do next, we just make the dish and we have the pieces of the story, we write a book. And we have the pieces of the data story, we write the data story in the STEM language. This, this is what we will do next. So this is the final product of the STEM model doesn't make too much sense to you. So what I would suggest you to do is that, or suggest myself to do is I will um, open R and we will do it together. Or maybe if you have a small screen, you can't really follow me to do it together. You can just watch uh, how I do it. If you have two screens, then you can really try to do it together with me.
Yeah, good. Can you, can you see the screen? Can you see my art studio? Yeah, good. Okay. Is that large enough? I mean, if I write down something, is it large enough? Good. <clears throat> so what do we do now? So you see here, this is our like project folder, and we have a just the scripts folder. You go in there. So you actually don't have to go in there. So what we do now is we will create an empty script. So here, this is an empty one. So for you, if what you can do is not maybe let's do it slowly. Um, for you, if you know the shortcuts, it will be control shift and cap and N, control shift and N. So then you can um, create an empty script already. This is one way. Alternatively, so here, those are the manuals of the software. This one is file. You could do new file. You could actually do a stand file you can indeed create a stand file in R. And you see here, there are some interesting parts already. We don't need them now, but this is there. So the blocks are provided already. <clears throat> okay. But for now, we don't need it because I really want to show you everything from, from bottom up. So we build it from bottom up. So now what do we have? So we have an empty script, right? So what do we do? We save it inside the script folder, and then we could name it. So let's say my first binomial, binomial model. Stand. So the name doesn't matter. You don't even have to follow up what I have. But uh, the important part is the file extension. So this is the dot stand file. Then we have to give the file extension to be stand. And then you save it. And R will say, well, do you really want to change the file extension? Yes, I'm sure. So please change it. So now we have an empty stand file. So what do you see here? Yes. Try to make one comparison. So if if I if I open up if I create an, another an R script, so you see here the, this icon, the small icon. Can you see my cursor, right? This small icon. This is R. And then if I change the file extension, then it will become Stan. So here this is Stan logo that we see from the slides. It will it will change accordingly. So. Uh, this is one of the advantage of using R Studio when coding your STEM models. It, it is because there are some integrated functionalities from R uh, from R Studio to work with STEM. I, I don't think this is possible in Python or in other languages. This is more available in R. Okay. Anyway, still empty. We don't yet have. We haven't done much. So. If you can follow me, just you, you also you could also open up a new empty script and do it together with me. If you are not able to do it at the moment, it's just watch. <clears throat> so recall that we are trying to write a data story or a model using the STEM language. We have some blocks that we have to follow. So those data and transform the data parameters, transform the parameters model and generate the quantity. The names, the chapter names, they can't be changed. So we have to use it. Those are the skeleton and we just fill in the, the meat, right? Um, what do we have? We have like in as, a, as, a sim, as the simplest model, we have to define, as I said, multiple times, we have to define the known part, we have to define the unknown part, and we have to decide de define the linking part. This is this is a minimum, the simplest version of the stand data story. So what is the known part? Known part is data, right? We write down the data and with a curly bracket. So that's a curly bracket is everything inside that block. 
we have parameters. This is another log which uh, where we will define the unknown part. And then the last one is, if you remember, we have model. The model block is the central part that is defining the story. <clears throat> what observations do you have? So you, you see that if I write something else with a typo, for example, or just read it something else, likelihood, it doesn't make sense even. Well, it makes sense, but like, uh, yeah, <clears throat> like, whatever, this is all right. So one observation is it is white, the color, it is white. However, if I change it, to the, the name that is designated to be a stamp block, then the, 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 there is a, uh, there's a color highlight. So that this is also a way to avoid making mistakes. So if you by any mistake, you'll say, well, models or models, you will immediately visually detect that you are making mistakes. So change it. The, those names, those block names, data, transform the data, parameters, transform the parameters, model, generated quantity, they have to be the same. If they don't, then the color is not changing. You could also be able to realize. All right, so uh, this is observation one, color highlights. Observation two, we will use curly bracket to uh, give the boundaries of the blocks. <clears throat> What else do we have? Um, we can write down some comments. So remember that if you are like writing some programs and it's nice and neat and it's working well, but nobody can understand it, this is not good. And we would appreciate a better approach where we document everything. We try to remind our future self what we did, what we've done for our analysis. So do, in, in the process of making in the in the within the process of analyzing your own data, you are in the zone, right? If you are in the zone, you know everything. Everything makes sense. It's great. The greatest model that you have. But maybe two weeks later, you forget everything uh, if you don't comment it right. So to be able to thank your past self, uh, it is always recommended to write down the comments to what you have done. Even though that's obvious, it's also recommended, still recommended to write down the comments. So here what we have. Um, to write down comments in R, we know that we could use the hash tag to write down uh, the comments. It is still supported, but it is not appreciated instead. So instead, we will use here, can you see that? We will use double slash to write down comments. So what is common in programming languages, if you know? So comments means it will not be executed. It is only for like text, 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 textual, um, like uh, for information, for you to know what is going on. It will not be run. It will not be executed. All right. So, what is data? Well, data is obvious, but we can say well, this is the way both we know. And the parameters we say, well, these uh, actually these are the variables we do not know, but we are interested in, right? Let me change this one to this is okay. Those are the variables we know, and these are the variables we do not know, and the model. Here we link the known to the unknown. <clears throat> okay, so just write down uh, some some comments. You can write down the way you like. It won't make any difference. You don't have to follow what I say. <clears throat> so let's move on to um, the data block inside the data block. What we have. So recall from the previous slides, we have only three variables as easy as W, N, and theta. W and N, they are the known part. Theta, it is the unknown part, okay? So what we do here, we do like, we have, cap we have small, well, maybe let's say, we have capital N, which is total number of experiments. We have a small W, 
the, to the total number of water observations. The subnorm part, we know it, good. And we also know how we call this unknown parameter, we call it theta, you just write down theta, spell it. Um, good, but is it not, is it enough? It is in fact far from being enough if you only have the, the name of the variable. Make it organizer. We have to do a little bit more um, adjustments, a little bit more modification. So if you write a R language, let's say this is R, this is better for us for testing. So if let's say N equals nine and then W equals six, you can just simply run it, right? And then in the end, it will tell you here, n is nine and the w is small w is six. It's good. Do you have to worry about if this variable is continuous or it is discrete? You don't, you just write down, right? If let's say in another case, we have uh, something called just theta equals 0.5. 0.5 is a continuous variable with the floating point, decimal point. <clears throat> we just define it this way and it will be automatically, it will autom automatically be a, a continuous variable. We don't have to worry about the, the nature of the, the variable type, but instead it is very strict. So we have to explicitly declare if the variable is continuous, or if the variable is discrete, because or, um, um, the Bernoulli, the binomial uh, distribution, we say here W we have a binomial where capital N and then theta, this and this and then this. We are describing that in a graphical way, right? This is W discrete. We have N, we have theta. So, so this is circle, this is continuous, this is discrete, this is uh, discrete, this is also discrete, this is with shade, with shade, okay? This, th there is a specification, it has to be like this. So the theta is, has to be continuous and then the W and then the capital N, they have to be discrete. Okay, let's, let's just leave it here for a second. Okay. Good. <clears throat> And then this is what we will do. So instead, if we do have to declare that this create versus continuous, we do what? So we say uh, this is an int. int means an integer. So it is an integer. So it is continuous. It is discrete. And another specification instead is every single line we have to use a semicolon to determine to, to terminate it. So every line, if you write, if you finish writing each line, you will have to write a semicolon to tell us that this is the finish of this line. So if I, I give you another example. So if I say, uh, this might be wrong, but let's say if W equals, no, maybe I use a different color. If X is uh, A plus B, if I write this way, it is equivalent to if I write this way, where they are at uh, different lines, appears they are, they are located in different lines, but for stand, for stand, they are the same. As long as you terminated the line correctly. So what does that mean in a generic uh, language? That means this is, those are white space, Right space does not matter. As long as you don't tell us then I have, now I have to finish this line, then we'll not interpret it as a finished line. So writing this way will not be 
sufficient enough for Stan to detect this is a finished line. It will go until it finds a semicolon. Okay, so that's why a semicolon is very important. We don't even need to, to remember all the backstory here. All you need to remember is as long as you finish a line, you write a semicolon. This is you have to remember. <clears throat> So what is w? w same integer, right? Discrete variables, variable. And for theta, before we declare the data type, what we can do is well, semicolon, great. What is that? Continuous variable. Continuous variable, we have to use a keyword called real. So then it becomes a continuous variable. And uh, what else do we have? We also know the range of the theta parameter. So theta is a parameter describing proportion of water covering the, the earth. It is between zero and one proportion, right? Cannot be negative, cannot be above one. So it has a range. How could we able to declare or define the range of the parameter? Uh, it turns out that we have to use something like this in a square triangle, uh, triangular bracket. So we have like smaller and greater sign on the keyboard, basically. So we say lower equals zero, upper equals one. So this is how we define the range of the parameters. And the low, lower and upper, they are also keywords in Stan. So here you see the color is highlighted rather than if you write another R, then it will become white. This is not correct. And another observation that I guess you have seen or you realize is the type of the data variable, the data type, the declaration is using a different, slightly different color. So in this case, it is like lighter yellow, but it depends on your R theme, it will appear a little bit differently. Good. And do we have anything else? So here we have this graph, right? The graphical illustration. Theta is unknown continuous between zero and one. Okay, we, we, we implemented already, it's perfect. Now we have two other variables, W and N, they are known so that they're in the data block, good. They are discrete, so they are integers, integers, good. Is, is there anything else that we have to consider? So it turns out that yes, a little bit. So the W and N, can they be negative? It's no, right? So the total number of experiments has to be positive. The total number of op water observation has to be po positive or at least zero. So at least they have to be greater or equal to zero. And uh, can we realize that or implement this in the standard language? Yes. So now that you know, we can use the smaller and larger uh, sign, this triangular bracket to write down the ranges of the parameter. We do the same for n and w. Okay, good. And it might be the case that you want to be extra careful. So what does, what, what, what does that mean? We have total number of n and we have a number of water observation. So if this is nine, if this is six, everything's great. So can this number be larger than nine? No, right? If we have nine experiments, is it possible to observe 10 water? No, it's not possible, right? It's not possible. So what we do, we say we are upper equals capital N. So here, the upper boundary, the upper bound, doesn't have to be a number that you give. It can also be a variable. So here, because n is a variable, and we can actually just give variable here so that everything is now just taken care of, let's say. Good. Make sense so far? I guess I, I'm making easy things quite, com sounds more, more complex than it, it should be. But I think with this more detailed explanation, you're understanding everything uh, better. I didn't write much yet, only three lines here. And here, that's it. I didn't write much. Either. 
Gut. Okay, then let's move on to the, the real, real, in, real, um, really interesting part, the core part. So what do we have? Uh, we have a binomial process that I erased, but I can write down again. So we have W more uh, uh, distributed as a binomial distribution. I just say B with capital N and theta, okay? To implement this line in Stan, it's pretty straightforward because Stan follows mm, the common naming system of statistical distributions. I wrote this way, then I just read it this way. So W is distributed as a binomial distribution. Binomial by, no, yeah. So because I was checking or changing because the color is supposed to be different. When it's white, I know I have a typo or anything. Binomial first, capital N, then theta. And then save it. That's it. It's, it follows the standard naming system. What you have in a st statistical book, you just copy it, paste that here, follow the same uh, structure. And then the first one is capital N. And then the second one is the success rate. And importantly, every line, if you finish writing, give a semicolon. There are only when you are describing the blocks here and here, you don't have to give the semicolon, it doesn't make sense. But anything in between the curly brackets, you have to use semicolon every single line. Okay. And then you could have a little bit more uh, comments to make it look uh, nicer. So at the very beginning, we could say this is a course example of a binomial model. And some people, they also uh, give themselves a hint at the end to say end of script. There is a kind of style thing. It doesn't make so much difference. In fact, no difference at all. So this is the entire model that we have. So let's have a brief revisit. So look at here, the, the, the drawing. So we have three variables. We have the W, we have the capital N, we have the theta, the W and N, they are the known variable. And they are also discrete. The theta is the unknown variable. It is uh, also continuous. So then we just, um, declare all of the variables according to the nature they are, and then in those corresponding blocks. So in the data block, we define the N and the W, and in the parameters block, we define the theta. And lastly, we know that if they, we know that this process follows a binomial uh, distribution, so we will just write, simply write down the binomial distribution. A few places to keep uh, attention to, to pay attention to. So each single line, we will have to use a semicolon to terminate it. And each variable that we declare, we will also have to declare the type continuous versus discrete, continuous versus discrete. And whenever applicable, we will also have to give the range of the parameters. So some of, for, for linear regression models, the slope can be positive, it can be negative, it can be anything. In this, in this place, we don't even need to give a range. But if we know, if the range of the parameter is part of the model, then we have to give it, okay? And then here as well, this is uh, also that to, to make sure that we do not enter negative N and we do not enter negative W. And here we also make sure that the number of water observation cannot be exceeding uh, the total number of experiments. And you might wonder that this ranges, is this one needed? This must be there because if this number is larger than one or smaller than zero, 
this line won't, not, won't work. This line won't work. So the theta, there is a theoretical meaning between zero and one. We have to keep the range. However, these ranges here and here, do they have to be there? And the answer is not really, it's not necessary, but it's better to be there. So as long as this number is a positive integer or zero, and this number is a positive integer or zero, as long as they are this kind of data, you won't receive an error. Okay, we run it here. It's the, the ranges here we define is only for us to make sure that we do not miss, miss we do not make mistakes. So because as I mentioned earlier, we send data from R to STEM, sending from R to STEM, but maybe you are tired after a long day of working, you send the wrong data from R to STEM. You use the negative uh, nine and the negative six for the data part. And to, to try to uh, avoid this situation in the first place, we give the sanity check. So here, this range is, is more for the sanity check. It doesn't have to be there, but it's better to be there. And this is a must. This has to be there, okay, 100%. Good. And after writing that, so this is like writing paper, writing a novel, writing everything, writing anything. And after writing, usually, like if I give you a deadline, I ask you to write a paper. If you write, you are happy with what you wrote, but maybe you also want to check if you have some typos, if you have some grammatical mistakes, if the page number is correct, right? Some, anything like that. We do the same here. We do some checking. So what do we check? We check if everything is grammatically correct. Same, same thing. We check the gra grammar. Stan, they have their grammar. It's a language. It has grammar. And how, how can we check grammar? Do we have like the checker? Do we have Grammarly, for example? So it turns out, yes, can you see my cursor here? So the top right corner, there is a check button. If you click on it and wait for this, my computer is slow right now. Not sure if it's working. Did I click one more time? It's not responding. Oh, wait. <clears throat> So if this is an R script, the check button is not there. So the check button is only specific to uh, the stand language, but for some reason, this is not responding. Well, well, well. I think it is just being slow. Okay, anyway, so we can check. Supposedly, there will be a like message says everything's correct or not, right? And if everything's correct, then you can just move forward. And if there is any mistake, the checking button will also notify you where the, the mistake, where the error can be, and then you are supposed to fix it. <clears throat> the error message is usually quite informative. It will tell you, well, which line there's an error, maybe line number 10, somewhere there's a semicolon missing, some, something is missing, something like that. And then you change it accordingly. And then you correct your mistake, and then you check the button again. If until when everything's okay, and then you are good to go. Questions so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah, start a new one. So time for, for questions. Everything makes sense.
or is it too much information? I think still, yeah, now the text finally appeared. Our studio. Yeah, so you see here, it says, uh, this is the path in the folder. This is the name of our model. It's syntactically correct. This means grammatically correct. Correct. <clears throat> so when this is ready, then we are good to go. So now we, we only, did the first step. The first step is to come up with a data story. Now we have this data story. We have data, right? We haven't done the model fitting. The MCMC part is not yet here, not yet functioning. So now what we do is we go to the next step to use MCMC for the model fitting. And before that, let's see if there is any question. Yes, good. Yeah, three, uh, two questions. So could we also specify the parameters like the model? So like theta is, form, is distributed as a uniform distribution, zero, one. Yes, this is an excellent question. So on the slide, I say here, yes, here. Here, because we are doing Bayesian statistics, Bayesian modeling, Everything we, we do, we have to need, we need to have a prior, right? So theta is uh, in between zero and one. So do I have to put it here? And if I do, where do I put it? So what we do is that we could do this way. So theta is uniform, zero one. <clears throat> so if we do it this way, we put it here, if we do. But now the question is, do we need to do it? The question is, the, the answer is, it is not entirely necessary. So why? It is because if we declare the parameter in this way with the upper boundary and the lower boundary, both specified, now we can write a comment. It is equivalent to um, theta uniform. Zero one. It is equivalent to that. So this is already like implicitly there. As long as you want to have a uniform prior, then you don't need this line. But if you really want to have a ununiform prior, you want to have a prior where, uh, let's, let's briefly draw it. If you want to have a uniform prior, zero one, then we don't have to specify this line. But if you want to have a prior where is it like this, right? Centered around the point five, centered around the point five, and uh, it's not uniform prior, then we will indeed specify the prior of like the one I have. So in this case, it can be like a beta 10, 10, for example. I didn't introduce beta prior, but like it is somehow the shape that I have. Good. You can Google that. You can see the Wikipedia, what is beta prior? So beta prior is like for any parameter in between zero and one, it, any shape it can, it, any shape of, any parameter between zero and one can be described by a beta prior or beta distribution. Mm -hmm. So maybe let me spend a few minutes on that. So let's say we have a range of zero one, what can it look like? So it can be like this, right? It can be like this, it can be like this, or the other way around, or maybe centered around 0.5, or maybe super centered around 0.5, right? 
it can also be like this. So zero and one, there is a high density, but in the middle is nothing. So all of these uh, shapes can be described by a beta distribution with two input arguments. So as long as these two numbers are equal, like 10, 10, we will get this kind of distribution. It's centered around 0.5. The larger this number is, the narrower the distribution it will be. And then if these two numbers are unequal, if let's say this is 10, but this is 100, then it will just be shifted. I think I always get the number wrong. So I think if this is 100, it will be, the center will be between 0 and 0.5, or maybe the other way around. I just really can't remember correctly. But anyway, as long as these two numbers are not correct and are, are not equal, it will be shifted. Again, the num the larger the number that is, the narrower the, the distribution it will be. So if this is 10, 100 versus if it's 110 and 1000, it will be sh shifted a little bit. And uh, if those numbers A and B, they are be below zero, maybe let's say beta 0.1, 0.3, it will be more or less this kind of distribution by by model thing two peaks zero and one like this. So here you could also tell that well the input of the beta distribution it doesn't even have to be an integer. So here if I say instead of ten I say ten point one it's is that fine? Yes, it's definitely fine. It is okay. So beta distribution is a super powerful uh, distribution to describe any shape in between zero and one. As long as you know your parameter is between zero and one, you can use beta distribution to specify your prior. Maybe if you read some literature, you have some parameter is centered around point three and you want to specify it, how? Yeah, beta distribution. Now you ask, well, I don't have a parameter between zero and one, I have a parameter between zero and two. How to do it? It's actually simple. So we have just multiply two in front of beta, right? Beta itself is between zero and one. Zero and one multiply two is zero two. If you have like mi minus range, like between minus two to one, how to do it is also simple. Multiply minus one in front of it. So as long as there's, there's a range, we use beta and then it's really flexible. If there is no upper limit or no lower limit, this is a little bit tricky. You can't do it with beta, but as long as there's a range, it doesn't have to be zero one, you just scale it, use numbers like in front of it. Good. <clears throat> but for our case, we for now used a uh, unit, uniform the prior because this specification, it implies a uniform prior, then we don't have to write it, okay? Good, there's another one. Uh, uh, so um, I don't really understand the advantage of stand over checks. So because of the algorithm, or is there any other practical differences? Yeah, the algorithm per se. So the, 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 the GIPS sampling, is a variant of the metropolis sampling. So if you if you know a little bit how that works, is like you fix one. If you have multiple parameters, you fix one of it, and then you change the other dimension, and then you sample from it. Instead of all the samples can be drawn like automatically and independently, it's not like that. So this is already not so efficient. This is one. And for two, it takes a lot of memory. So RAM on the computer, uh, less than STEM. Well, more than STEM. So it takes quite long. In our case, if we, if we use if for complicated models, for complex models, the default version of the MCMC chains, 2000 MCMC visits is usually enough for most of the models, even for complicated models. But for JAX, I have done MCMC samples where I had nearly 100,000. It runs for ages, but it still doesn't convert, didn't convert. So this is really horrible in terms of data analysis because your, your, your model is 
so great and you want to see the result, you have to wait and then it won't give you a reliable result. This is not appreciated. Yeah. So you could remember two reasons. One, the algorithm per se it's, itself is more efficient. For two, it consumes less memory. Both are important. And if you consider interaction between the efficiency and the memory consumption, and then that is definitely the winner between the two. There are more reasons, but I think it's a little bit beyond the scope. All right, any other questions? Uh, we are nearly uh, the end of today's session. It's good. My computer is just being super slow now. <clears throat> Oh yeah, okay, good. Let me just use um three, four minutes to explain how we can fit the model to the data. We wrote our STEM model, everything's there. We have the data, but how to run it? We don't run it now, but I will just try to explain the procedure and then we can run it the next time. So uh, for now, this is R because I said we have R, we have STEM, we've done the STEM part. Now we have to send some data to STEM and STEM does his work or her work and then send the data back to us. So we have to give some data to Stan, right? So here, this is how we define the data. We have small w equals six and capital N equals nine. And then we combine our data into a data list. And then the data list, this variable will be transmitted to the Stan function call. So now question is why we use data list? Can we use data frame? No, so because this W is a scalar, this W, this N is a scalar is easy, but maybe in other cases we have a scalar and we have a matrix. So list, if you remember data type, it is quite generic. We could, it's kind of a container. We could stuff in anything. And the list is more, 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 more flexible and general. So that it doesn't matter what we give to us then, we can always put them into a data list. So here, uh, we say this is small w and capital N. Can we change it to like small w, small n, or lar large capital W, capital N, both? Can we change? The answer is yes, we can change as long as the number, the name, the variable name here, they are consistent with here, right? So first, so usually what I do is I will write down all of my data variables in R, and then I remember how I call it, and then I will use the same name in the stand file so that they're consistent. It's just like calling names. If you don't call me Lei, you call me something else. I, I, I don't know you're calling me, right? You have to use the same name to, to, to address the person, to address the data variable. And then uh, as usual, so whenever we use a package, we have to load the package using library. And then there are some specifications I'll explain to you later. And then this is the path to tell Stan where our model is. So here in this particular case, we have to change it. So my first binomial, something like that. This is the number of MCMC visits in total, the total length of the chain, 2000. And here we want to run multiple chains in order to get it uh, to in order to obtain a reliable model estimation so in by default we have four chains and then they start from random locations so this is a warm up so what warm up is new a little bit new to us so in total we have 2000 samples and then the first half so here the first half of the samples they will be used to determine some internal algorithms and then the second 1,000, the second half, they are the actual samples. But we will, I will tell you later next week. <clears throat> and then thinning is another variable that uh, is a little bit 
useless. Usually I don't use, usually you just say one is fine. But here, this is common. And then here are some helping messages, doesn't matter. And then just uh, briefly, this is the final function call, the most important one. We call it stand. This is the file name, my first binomial model. Here I gave the data uh, list as the input, number of chain four, number of iterations 2000, and number of format half of it 1000. What is the thinning? Thinning is just one, as I said, and the starting location, random, four random locations. Is there a seed for like random number generation to reproduce yourself precisely each time you run it, you can just have a seed. And then there some other helping messages. And then what do you do in most of the cases is you just, you just select the entire chunk and then you run it. And then you will be able to obtain the results to get your first stand feeding. Actually, if, uh, I, if you are like finishing today, if you didn't follow me or you just, if you are only watching, you can watch again. And then to create your empty stamp, empty file and save it as then and then follow entirely what I wrote. It will only take you, I think, 10 minutes. And you could actually run everything on your computer. And this is also helpful to check if your stand is successfully installed in your uh, R environment. And then let's do the interpretation next week. Okay. Are there any questions?